Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Good. 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 We all appreciate your presence. This is Jazz and Self-Determination number four. Uh, another installment of a series of discussions uh, where the actual participants and primaries in creative music provide the narrative uh, from different age ranges and um, it's jazz oriented uh, for sure but inclusive of black music in general. It's not coming from an elitist perspective because there's a similar sociological intent as far as self-determination has run through every form of the music. But um, yeah, this is like a jazz emphasis and um, to let that have a little bit stronger, a stronger presence within the uh, context of all the great social discussions that go on all the time because um, there's so many parallel dynamics on so many levels, uh, economically, uh, socially, uh, questions of, uh, that came up actually on the last discussion which we did in reference to archiving and uh, that's been an issue with black artists, especially black artists from a certain generation and um, some uh, different things that happen in reference to the archives, some good and some bad, and uh, questions dealing with documentation, and uh, things that happen where the music is created all at once. So, all three and myself just facilitate the artists speaking on that in a historical context. Uh, certainly not to negate the fact that there's great music happening right now. So it's like cyclical from the historical to right now and the impact of the historical on the newness of what's currently happening because everyone here um, is very inspirational in that part that they keep creating new things and uh, play music and write and uh, we do um, the totality of what's involved with music and it's an honor for me that they accept to be part of this panel in the past panels and uh, just to personalize it slightly they're here because you know I feel you know those are the spirits that I felt that should be and all fear as well we have all fear Sully Cole who's a uh, moderator and I have to say she's a great educator who I learned a lot from as well she's going to ask questions um, Jeremiah was there, bassist, uh, writer, journalist, organizer, leader of the band Earth Driver, EarthDriver.org, Professor Greg Tate, founder member of the Black Rock Coalition, writer of uh, some great articles in the Village Voice that I used to be faithfully every week <laughs> on my way to wherever I was going. So was every At the time, and uh, Author some great books like Nothing But the Bird and the Flyboy and the Little. Um, he represents the serious continuum of, of black arts activity as far as uh, people who create music being engaged in every dynamic of uh, the music as far as what's happening. And Althea is Southern Cole as well as a great musician, practitioner of the core. And uh, we have him what we call like an African jazz duo or trio sometime, which is added with a rhythm guitar. And she is uh, Yeah, so let's, let's, without further ado, get on to the discussion. Um, in previous sections of this um, ongoing panel discussion that will never end, um, we've discussed, as Ross mentioned last time, we talked about the politics of archives and the material um, results of jazz and how, yeah, they relate to the economics of jazz and what can be made of them now and, you know, seeing records that, you know, some of which are here today, you know, these records that are now on sale, say, on eBay for $1,000 and the artists aren't seeing any of that, right, and what that means. Um, last week at the forum we discussed um, the actual venues and their loss and the loss of community and what that meant. And so there are just so many vectors and perspectives 
to think through these questions. Um, so I just wanted to start with something really foundational with you two, and I'll be for um, Ahmed Abdullah, is, you know, for you, both in how you produce your music, but also how you experience the music of others, what does determination mean? How do you interpret that word? And how do you think about that word? Just to start from that real basic level before we ultimately get into some specifics for you both. I would love to hear some thoughts on that. Well, I think with the with Black Rock Coalition, um, when we initiated um, Maybe just the, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we initiated that in 85 and it was really operating uh, well with the sense that um, we needed to create a, a platform for advancing all of these uh, original innovative ideations of ideations of, of, uh, of uh, what black music could be. Um, at that time, it really didn't have a place within the, uh, you know, within the corporate industry. You know, didn't even really have so much of a place in uh, downtown music culture, um, uh, which was uh, kind of strange and, and, and ironic given uh, who our predecessors were. So, but we, Realized from following the example of uh, organizations like the AACM um, and uh, you know Bad Egg and um, you know the Strata East label um, that was started by uh, Stanley Cow and Charles Oliver. That you know, it was really important for musicians to become uh, the, the architects of uh, and the activists of uh, of their own destiny. You know, um, so it was very much about creating an organization that's going to be very proactive. You know, it's going to go out and create uh, concert, uh, you know, venues for musicians and create forums for musicians to share information um, and to be, you know, a, a bunch of crazy young iconoclasts um, who were, um, you know, going to create a community you know, out of their, um, their dissonance, you know, and their, uh, their difference, um, and their kind of opposition to, to the status quo, you know. And so, you know, we began doing these multi-night um, uh, festivals at places like CBGB's where, you know, we put, you know, four or five bands on, and each one, you know, um, you know had its own sound, its own politics, its own yeah. image, you know. Um, and, um, you know, and I think one of the things that we learned early on, too, though, was that most of our support initially didn't come from the musician community. It came from uh, people who rallied around, uh, you know, our, our, we wrote this manifesto, uh, you know, where we said, you know, rock and roll is black music, we are its heirs, you know. And a lot of people who came in, you know, because we had a regular meeting space. Um, at a gallery owned by uh, a good friend of ours, Linda Bryant, real pioneer, um, uh, kind of the first black woman who owned a you know, conceptual art. Yeah, she's a legend in the own right, you know, uh, you know, from starting this gallery um, down, in, down in Solo. You know, but um, yeah, she had this space, uh, the jam space was on uh, Broadway between uh, Princeton Broom. And just to let you know, uh, kind of the difference between real estate then and real estate now. She had two whole floors of former manufacturing <coughs> facility, you know, textile manufacturing facility. Um, and so we met there, you know, um, for probably about the first two years of the organization. And yeah, most of the people who were coming in um, were people just from, you know, the community who loved music, you know, loved being in the sporting arts. Uh, it was also kind of a period where kind of the, the um, anti-racist movement, black power movement, you know, um, had kind of dimmed in terms of its public profile. So these were also people looking for something to kind of address um, their need to come together as a, as just, you know, 
black folks with a political consciousness, you know, um, and we know the like-minded folks, so you know, we were kind of an interesting default um, for that for that particular moment. And um, um, but you know, folks, you know, folks were definitely in support of um, kind of the ideals of the of, of music, and uh, also. There were a lot of folks there who just generationally, uh, we got you know some folks who were in their early twenties. I mean, didn't know jack about the history of, of black music other than what they grew up hearing on the radio. So, you know, some folks you know of course didn't even know the uh, uh, kind of black foundations of rock and roll. Didn't even know there were contemporary black people who played you know the music. You know, um, so you know it's one of those things that when you actually kind of do take the, the initiative to, uh, to uh, you know, kind of make, you know, make a stand. Um, all these other beautiful things kind of come in the door with it in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, camaraderie, in terms of conversation, in terms of, uh, you know, connection um, with folks who otherwise might have never
aside from, you know, a message or a particular fact or something that I could convey to you in a song, more importantly, maybe just a note or a harmonic frequency or a rhythm might just trigger a next thought, which will lead you to the next thought, hopefully, if we need new ideas. So, yeah, that's my answer to the self-determination question, which is like an immediate question that I'm dealing with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Roz, you title the, these panels. What, what does it mean to you to think about determination in terms of jazz? Yeah, that was titled that just instantly <laughs> popped up in my head. Uh, I viewed it along the same lines myself. I kind of grew up in that context of um, kind of growing up within the uh, black nationalist, uh, revolutionary nationalist, black arts movement. And um, so seeing the perspective that the art was parallel with the environmental factors and the sociology of the environmental factors was given, especially jazz. Uh, one, because of uh, its open nature. As Max Roach used to say all the time, uh, jazz represents how society is supposed to be structured. A very real freedom guided by uh, a schematic, not that it lessens the, uh, the individual or uh, individual contributions, but it all adds up to make it one functional uh, little entity like that. And um, there were cultural centers, uh, most specifically the East Cultural Center in Brooklyn which I was certainly a child, a kid, kid, you know, but I do, you know, the energy stays with you. I was seeing the people, you know, like Farrell Sanders, Gary Barnes, early Norman Collins, stuff like that. So I kind of, and we're going to get back to the panelists and act this, but I kind of, um, you know, I can use that as a uh, something to counteract the narrative in reference to what specifically black people can or can't understand in the music. It's not a new topic at all, but it still exists at the same time. Because I remember people right in the community being uh, enthusiasts of cutting edge music. Uh, music in all its forms. I mean, you know, there are people that like the avant garde, do not like it like anybody else, but to say that, you know, things just have to be what kind of uh, it's a generalization in the form of internalized racism. It got kind of <clears throat> internalized as an education paradigm, in way, which is not good. Um, parallel issues that education is important and they're leaving out the tradition is bad too, because that could be like a form of reverse elitism that I've seen in some circles where uh, they think the so called free jazz is coming out of the vacuum, you know, and that's not the case, which I probably don't have to say in here, but it's just based on <laughs> uh, the observation of uh, different discourses and discussions about the music. You know, so, um, and the music, uh, and I'll make this brief before we go back to the panelists again, and another question, uh, which is not new, uh, well, how can jazz have social relevance if it doesn't have lyrics, you know, like, other aspects of music with topical focus, you know, so called folk music, stuff like that. One perspective is that you can um, feel the, uh, the same student energy in music, it's expressing the same kinds of things socially through the sound. Uh, but you can use words as well, too, you know, because that's a very strong um, way of putting out the message. And, uh, that was the gift of people like Stevie Wonder and the Women Fire. They had the gift of um, innovating uh, pop culture dynamic and innovating that, you know. I mean, the jazz is in so many things. That was the purpose of this discussion. It was, you know, it's about jazz, but it's about other forms of the music uh, as well, because it's all connected. Yeah, you mentioned lyrics. The first person that comes to my mind is Jane Cortez. 
Cortez yeah. and the ways in which she used music as a conduit for her messages and just how beautifully that was arranged. Obviously, you've seen her also without musical backing, but she managed to cultivate something that was much bigger than both the words and the music through the combination mm -hmm. of the two, right? And so pushing a message through multiple sensorial realms, right? There's this realm of language and articulation in that sense, but then also this articulation through the form and the timbre of the music that, um, yeah, has come out through so, many, so much um, collaboration between writers and musicians, as you were talking about, Jeremiah, you know, the hope that journalists will be engaged with the music and I was going to say there's also kind of like a hidden sub-lyric in a lot of jazz and melody, like in performing James Blood Homer, I was amazed to see that he actually has lyrics for every melody line that he doesn't sing. Mm -hmm. Or he might sing intermittently, and he knows the lyric, but you don't know the lyric, you know it as an instrumental song. But it's like, oh, there's all this phrase, these phrased words that go with every little phrase in the guitar. And that whole melody means that to him. And he probably won't let the audience in on that. But then you have things like, you know, Love Supreme, where it's like you have a simple, very powerful mind and a melody that makes it that much more powerful. And I think there's a lot of that interwoven in, in the jazz music itself is, is a subtext or a subliminal message, if you will. So I just think that's that's an interesting thing that's definitely there. Yeah. And um, yeah. we've just been blessed by the presence of Mr. Ahmed Abdul. Yeah. And uh, we're going to definitely go right to Mr. Ahmed in a second. And, uh, and Greg, now we're sitting right here at LIU in reference to the history of the Black Rock Coalition. Now, I believe that uh, that all formed during the Renaissance that was kind of happening in this particular area. I mean, I'm sure it was all over, but it was kind of uh, at the time. Uh, yeah. Well, kind of trying to work with. Well, I mean, um, you know, uh, you know, we started in, um, uh, like I said, in Soho, and uh, you know, oh, in right. the yeah, uh, gallery. You know, of course, you know, Vernon and uh, and some Reed and uh, I think Melvin Gibbs both went to, to Brooklyn Tech. You know, yeah. it was around the corner. You know, so it was a lot of a lot of Brooklyn presence. You know, in, in the culture at the time. But uh, but you know, you asked you know you asked that question about what Jeremiah just you know talked about. Um, you know, making that that link between radical forms of resistance and uh, you know and abstract music. And you know, of course, the timing of music is you know it's one of the key ways that musicians kind of advance. Um, their thinking and their, and their thoughts and their commitment, you know, to kind of using sonic, you know, uh, open up, you open up sonic space to open up social space, you know what I mean, uh, to, uh, to kind of confront, you know, opposition or oppressive forces, you know, so, you know, one of my favorite stories is about how, uh, you know, Randy Weston, the Uber Africa, and uh, uh, Max Roach is a we and sister from now, so we were both confiscated at the docks in South Africa in the early 60s, you know what I mean? So, you know, just if you're looking at musicians aligning themselves, you know, with the anti, you know, apartheid movement, you know, kind of, uh, you know, 20, 20, 20 or 30 years before the rest of the world, you know, literally jumped on, you know, that man wagon, uh, um, you know, says, a, you know, just says a lot about you know, how musicians supposedly, you know, uh, you know working within uh, an, ab an abstract medium uh, can kind of ensure that um, their, uh, their ideology, you know, um, becomes, you know, part of the identity of that, you know, that abstraction. You, know, you can't think about it without thinking about those intentions, you know. And, uh, you know, part of the story is that, uh, you know, kind of like the South African censors, you know, uh, made the point of saying any record that comes from America that has freedom in the title, just like, <laughs> 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 so, um, and, 
you know, and I'm sure that within um, kind of uh, the, the jazz critic circles, um, you know, that um, it might have been looked at as intriguing, you know, that these musicians have made this alignment. But, you know, as we know from who, you know, we know who Max Roach and, and Randy Weston are. You know what I mean? So that was like a lifetime of attention. You know, therefore it wasn't just uh, you know a moment in which they decided to like rise up, speak out. You know what I mean? Um, you know, um, you know. Uh, and I, you know, and you know, it just points to how important it is to have actually uh, the dialogue with the musicians who are really part of that music. You know that movement. You know what I mean? Because nobody was, you know, for the most part, operating, you know, um, under some random idea of, of, uh, of uh, you know, music significance and importance and its ability to contribute to the conversation. I mean, I mean, I think it's one of the people talk about archive. There's also there's also the issue of. Um, um, Getting the history right, you know, around uh, who these musicians were, how they functioned, you know, as, I mean, what their ideals were in terms of uh, you know, how, you know, uh, around creating revolutionary sounds, you know, the sounds is like that are, that are, that are still confrontational um, in terms of certain kind of conservatory ideas right. of what, you know, probably. You know, those sounds are still, still scary. You know, you know, you, you know what I mean? Like, like uh, it, it's, they're still disturbing. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, the, the music you have there, you know, in terms of those, those, uh, those albums. You know? Um, yeah. You know, because there's something just inherently fundamental, you know, mm -hmm. terrifying about um, black people taking control of destiny. In any form, but even in, you know, or especially within the context of music, you know, just considering how exploited that is as an expressive force. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I definitely want to get back to the addressing inherent strong history of black music mm -hmm. and how this plays into the issues of space and place and representation and all of this. But um, I also think you're hitting, when you say, um, opening up a sonic space to open up a social space. You're really hitting on something about determination, and I'd love to bring you in on um, thinking about how that's been experienced in your life and in your music um, to, you know, conversation. Right. Well, I come into the music in the 1970s, um, and in the 1970s there were um, many uh, places that were created, sonic places, um, from the efforts uh, that musicians uh, made to try to determine their our own destiny. Um, people call it the loft era. I call it the loft movement because uh, there was a movement uh, afoot that came out of a place called Studio We, which was on Eldridge Street. Uh, and there were people like James Du Bois and Juma Santo, Juma uh, Santo, 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 Juma Santo, who, um, who were running that particular organization. <clears throat> In 1971 uh, or 72, George Ween decided to bring uh, the Newport Jazz Festival to New York. Uh, but he excluded many of the grassroots musicians who uh, were in New York. And so as a protest to that, the musicians uh, formed the uh, New York uh, Musicians uh, Organization and, um, and decided to uh, protest against George Moon coming to New York. There were thousands of musicians who were, uh, who were, who were involved in that organization. And it became the New York Musicians Festival. Um, and uh, we were able to uh, find uh, places like parks all over New York City where we could play. And, and it, it actually did make an effect or uh, have an effect on George Wheat's festival. Um, the, the net result of that, um, in terms of opening 
spaces was that um, uh, Sam Rivers, who was one of the uh, uh, progenitors of that era, he opened a place called Studio Whitby, which was a place that he lived at. It was his uh, loft area on uh, Pond Street. Uh, eventually, Rashid Ali opened up Ali's Alley. Uh, there was a place called um, uh, the Ladies' Fort that opened up. There was a place called the Brook that opened up. All of these were venues that musicians actually ran. Who uh, uh, and they provided a place uh, that musicians could perform at uh, when we weren't able to perform at, uh, at clubs because we weren't playing uh, commercial music. We were playing music that was considered adventurous, and uh, the club owners wouldn't necessarily have us in their uh, venues. But so we created our own venues, and uh, those venues became uh, known as the lofts. Yeah. And uh, we became known as the Loft Era, or as I say, the Loft Movement, because there was a political force behind it. Uh, and though uh, that stayed around from 1972 to about 1978, 79, uh, we still had uh, you know, venues that were lost that musicians were able to play. It was uh, one of the things that allowed me to be able to have another formation to be able to go on in the music, uh, because certainly I wouldn't have been able to play it like the Met, but it's Vanguard and the Village Gain and other uh, venues that were around during the time. So that was the, the basis of a, of a whole uh, era of developing uh, artists who uh, would otherwise not have been recognized at all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, and I was just looking at a, a great documentary on uh, pianist Mal Waldron, mm -hmm. and then he talks about like why he migrated to Paris you know, in the late 60s, early 70s, and he said it was because uh, there was just so much competition going on for, with musicians for these few gigs, right? So one of the things that the law movement did, you know, in, in organizations like the AECM as well was like bring this, this ethic of cooperation, collectivity, cooperation, you know, collaboration, um, to the way musicians interacted with one another, you know? It was like pooling these resources create these spaces where everybody could play the music they really wanted to play and not play um, you know a set list that was determined from you know I don't know if it's from the bottom up or the top down by these club owners. You know what I mean? Uh, because you know one of the things that um, you know certainly the, the that the you know the freedom movement encouraged was that everybody be a creator of your own music, your own compositions. It's like why keep giving money you know, um, to uh, you know these music publishers and these corporate entities, you know, playing music that was the pop music of the '30s and '40s, and kind of continue, you know, uh, to be um, you know so a source of income for people who had no interest in supporting your aesthetics and your community. You know, so um, one of the things that happened in the in in the, in the law firm was that like musicians playing each other's original music, you know, and it would change, it could change from night to night, uh, set to set. You might see someone be a, a, a supporting musician in, uh, say, you know, him the Threadgill situation, and those same musicians, you know, him the Threadgill would be, you know, playing the music of the author of life of, you know, Anthony Davis or David Murray or whoever, you know. But um, you know that was something that was that was unique and important about that movement as well, you know. Um, and uh, um, and there was, of course, you know, when you look at the economics and the exploitation of the music, you know, uh, the people who got rich, you know, uh, off of um, you know uh, kind of being presenters and marketers, and, you know, record labels and so forth. Um, you know, it was it was just a really kind of key radical intervention into you know what we call the you know um, the jazz economy or the jazz industry as it existed up to that up to that time. You know. And you know, I'm sure like you know, very threatening you know to the powers that to be. You know, you know, in some ways, um, you know, like whenever you have that level of collective resistance, you know, there's a counterforce that has to has to emerge and you know we kind of look at the corporatization of jazz that took place in the 80s it was certainly in resistance too you know i mean consciously you know what i mean it's like 
was ideolo ideologically in resistance to that, to those musicians, <coughs> that movement, that music, you know, uh, because what it, you know, what it did was, you know, for the, the musicians, the young musicians who were coming in uh, in the 80s, it established that, you know, your master, your boss is going to be his record label. That's what you need to be pursuing and you need to be playing music that kind of toes that line as well, you know. In, in reference to that, what, uh, what Greg just said, uh, Mr. Ahmed, um, is it a generalization to say that there was a decline of, of the loss because that implies that the activity stopped happening? Was that a generalization to say, or um, was that, or is it a case of the loss that had a certain kind of presence had to close, yet the activity continued in general? Or it, it seemed like a con I've heard it said that it seemed like a concerted effort, which is exactly what uh, Greg just said, to kind of, um, which is related to the economics, of course, um, of the spaces that was presenting music. There was a, a deluge of these places closing or the music shifting to other locations. I think that um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that there was an end to the law movement was that the, uh, um, it was basically done in a re as a reaction, uh, or more than an action, to, uh, to determine the destiny of musicians. Uh, when you do things out of reaction, uh, they tend to not be as well planned as they could possibly be. So the, the longevity of the law movement had a, a lot to do with that. I think the people decided they were going to create their, uh, their venues and they did that, and um, when something happened, it didn't uh, fall along the, the lines of what people expected, um, they folded. And so by the 1970s, in the 1970s, yes, it was the end of the era, and it was the beginning of a new era. We have to understand that Ronald Reagan came into, into power in 1980, and that, it was a major shift in the, uh, in the uh, political reality of this country. Uh, there was a major shift uh, as far as the Lower East Side was concerned. Those laws that were available uh, to musicians at a very low uh, uh, fee were no longer available. People were, uh, the area that we were talking about is, is Soho. But you can imagine uh, the area of Soho uh, uh, being the, an impoverished area, uh, area, you know, where you could actually get a loft, you could be in a loft for a few hundred dollars. Uh, to today, when you're talking about millions of dollars, uh, you know, just to even sit on the stoop, uh, possibly, you know what I'm saying? You know, it, it, it really is a contract. So things change, uh, you know, in the, as far as the reality is concerned. But uh, while things changed, there were still active uh, things that were going on. Uh, for instance, in the 80s, you had a, an organization called Moby, the Musicians of Brooklyn Initiative. That, uh, Lester Moody and Oliver Lake and Cecil Taylor uh, created. And that was something that was based in Brooklyn and was also uh, an active organization that uh, they, they tried to bring people together in some kind of way. You know, there's always been that kind of activity uh, because if you are an artist, you know that that is what you've got to do in order to get your, your art form to the public. You've got to work together with like-minded people in order to do that. So I fast forward to 1995. Um, uh, my wife and I became part of an organization called Sisters Place. And some of the same ideas that we had in, uh, in the law movement, because I was the music director, I was able to implement them in, at Sisters Place. So we have now been in existence for uh, 24 years, you know, which is a triple the amount of time that any of the laws were uh, together. But we have learned the lesson. You know, I certainly learned the lessons from uh, those uh, organizations that were around in the 1970s. You know, we uh, at Sisters Place, we work together. It's, an organi it's a cooperative organization. There's not one person who is uh, running it. You know, we work together to bring this music into the community of Bedford Stuyvesant. And because of that, there is a, a certain longevity. We are a historic landmark institution now as of uh, three years ago. Yeah. You know, so the lessons have been learned and they've been passed along like that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, you, oh, yeah, you, you mentioned Dustin Foley, and, um, you know, of course, you know, everybody came out of the, the ACM was about um, 
cooperative action, cooperative economics, but the, the art ensemble of Chicago in particular benefited from uh, Lester's savvy in terms of um, you know how you you uh, work the resources you have to create the best situation you can for uh, you know for the musicians. So uh, after Lester passed, I talked to, to Don Moye, uh, the drummer for the you know uh, art ensemble of Chicago, and he just said said because of Lester savvy, he said you know he said everybody uh, um, you know in the AEC and had houses you know put their kids through college playing that music, you know. And uh, you know, he said he said he said that's why I'm winterizing my house now, you know, instead of like, you know, trying to trying to put a benefit together for Lester because he didn't he didn't need that. And he said, you know, he said Lester had a whole plan for like, you know, a lot of musicians um, you know, actually uh, you know, part of Moby and part of Law Movement um, kind of came under uh, less the sphere of influence ended up getting, you know, these brown cells in Brooklyn. I mean, musicians are generally uh, have been pioneers in terms of opening up these areas in, in New York, right? You know, like Soho, they were considered like uh, in, uninhabitable, you know, at the time in which, you know, I mean, you know, Sam Rivers and, and Rashi and all those folks got, uh, you know, got those spaces, you know, I mean, it would, you know, because it's post industrial. You know, New York, you know, on the verge, you know, the manufacturing industry, industry is on the way out in that area. And so there's nobody, nobody there, you know, like, uh, you know, and, and the thing was, it wasn't just so, I mean, musicians at that point were like, uh, where you would get lost in like Midtown, you know, because the industry there uh, was, was starting to fade, it was open, it's opening up the spaces. But, um, you know, when I was talking to Moye about, about Lester, you know, he said, uh, he said, uh, you know, he had a whole plan for musicians who wanted to, you know, like play the music they wanted to play, but you know, get a get a great living space in, in Brooklyn, you know. And so uh, he said, you know, when young musicians would come around, you know, Lester's question to them was like, uh, do you want a house or do you want to just be a renegade motherfucker? <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Um, you know, what he just said, yeah, he said, look, wherever we were, you know, he said, our ensemble went to Chicago, I mean, went to Paris, like, you know, Lester found him a place in, like, uh, an abandoned insane asylum, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> <laughs> or still functioning, it's so, you know, like, he just said, you know, he just said, like, he said, wherever we were, he said, we had quality of life. <laughs> but Lester, so it was like, and all the cats, they weren't, they weren't just over there, you know, kind of being Bohemian musicians, it was like their families, kids where they said they were cooking, rehearsing eight hours a day, you know, um, you know, because he, you had somebody who just was thinking on that level about how you take the resources you have, you know what I mean, to create the best situation for the creation of this music where you're not dependent, you know, on other folks. And that, you know, he said, like, yeah, we're not, you know, less than pass, there was no need for us to like, you know, pass the act, you know, try to pay for his funeral. It was like they they were set. But that was a part of the ethic of that music. It's like, you know, we're not going through this struggling artist bullshit, you know what I mean? Because there's ways to be sad about this and resourceful. Like you're talking about like resistance but absolutely. You know, I mean you can't stress enough just the difference that, you know, um, cooperative, collaborative mindset makes, you know, for people who already, as individuals, you've established, like, you're not down with the status quo, so why be about it on any level, you know what I mean? Like, why be dependent on a, on a, on a label, you know, um, which nobody is now, but just we're talking about the, we're talking about the 70s and the 80s, you know. In reference uh, to that, again, your role uh, would as the teacher said, it ties in to another thing in reference to your musical career because you played with Sun Ra, who's the embodiment of self determination. And you mentioned often, and you told me, which I didn't know too late, that your first gig with him was at a space that was the embodiment of self determination presented in the music called the East Culture Center. And that was your first gig with Sun Ra at that space. So that's a good convergence of outlooks in reference to where Sun Ra was coming from in the presence of that space 
in particular? That's right. Um, the, the East uh, Cultural Center um, opened about 1969. Um, I think that uh, Messia was telling us at the last conference that we had. And, um, and certainly, um, I played with Sun. I started my work with Sun about 1975. So, yes, the first performance I did with Sun was uh, April uh, 1975. But, you know, I was just uh, reminiscing the other day, uh, I actually played the, uh, the first graduation at the East with, uh, with Bluey, who just left the planet uh, uh, last year. Uh, 1970, I played their first graduation, which was called the Festival of Kings and Queens. And it was, um, uh, since they opened in 1969, they had their first graduation with Blue It uh, as their uh, star play. And it was also his first gig in New York City. Uh, and it was uh, pretty amazing, uh, pretty amazing to be a part of that. Uh, and, and I did get to work at the East um, many times uh, throughout there before I even worked with somebody because it was, it was a community center. Uh, they had a policy, the East had a policy of not allowing white people to come into their venue uh, during that time. It was a, a real black uh, establishment. They called themselves Yuruasasa Shu, Yuruasasa School. And they, um, it, it, there were people there who were running it who were teachers within the public school system. But they uh, didn't, uh, they wanted community control. Community control was a big thing. Uh, and they couldn't get it within the public school system. So they uh, did use Kuchi Chamani as self-determination and open their own, their own school. And, uh, and they would have musicians come in on, uh, on weekends, on uh, Saturdays and uh, Fridays. And, and that's how they also made money for the school. Uh, and it, um, the interesting thing is that they started uh, with this uh, street festival uh, about 1971 or so. They would have a, a street festival on 10 Cleveland Place. That street festival went, has turned into now the International African Arts Festival. Yeah. And it's an annual event. It's been going on now for 40 some odd years. And now they have it in Commodore Barry Park. And it is still called the International African Arts Festival. And it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It will start uh, July 1st. In fact, it will go on to July 4th or July 5th mm -hmm. uh, in Commodore Barry Park. July 4th. Yeah. So it starts, 4th it starts July 4th and mm -hmm. goes on to July 7th, my, my bad. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, but like that. So they, they have had uh, uh, this a continuum yeah, going from the school to now an International African Arts Festival. So Jeremiah uses word antagonism mm -hmm. um, in reference to the kind of resistance that Professor Tate was describing in terms of supporting creative artists in the larger music industry. Um, and specifically, you, you said, you know, addressing this antagonism by finding spaces in which artists can produce themselves. It's a sort of theme that we've been talking about throughout this panel. Um, and I'm curious, you, you mentioned specifically rethinking space, thinking about making bookshops into a space for music. Um, and I'm curious about how rethinking space um, relates to reframing music history, which is another thing that I feel like has come up thinking about, um, yeah, how, you know, uh, what Professor Kate was talking about in terms of, you know, addressing ignorance around black music, you know, reframing rock and roll as black music. How does this connection between space and place help us also address the ignorance surrounding um, black music? And I throw that out to anybody who wanted to answer. Because I'm really, especially with Sisters Place, with Earth Driver, these different projects, how do you view um, them as reframing music history? But then also, you know, what are the challenges as you, you say that Sisters Place, for example, is evidence of lessons learned through the law movement, what challenges remain in um, what or what lessons remain to be learned um, for places like Sister Place or for you know producing music in different spaces? One of the challenges that, um, that the music has always had is the name. What do we call the music? Yeah. <coughs> and uh, creating an institution 
by having created Sister's Place, we were fortunate enough to see what was going on there to realize that uh, the name that had been given to the music, uh, jazz, was inappropriate. Uh, so uh, we were able to see that over a period of time, um, you know, having musicians come in and play in a particular kind of way. We realized there was a certain kind of spiritual energy that was happening. And so we have, uh, after about five or six years uh, of producing music, right on the corner of Jefferson, in fact, a block away from where um, the East was, we um, decided that we would call the music, the, uh, the interaction that we were creating there, music of the spirit, jazz and music of the spirit. So we didn't, we didn't get rid of the name jazz, but we just expounded on it to say that, that this is what it is. In fact, we said that all of our art forms, all of the art forms that come from African people in this country, on this continent, are art forms of the spirit because that is really the guiding force that has allowed us to be here. It is because of the spiritual energy that we have as African people that we've been able to survive the enslavement for 400 years. We've been able to create in spite of the uh, conditions that we've been in. So it's a spiritual uh, force. And without having an institution where we could actually uh, measure what was going on over a period of time, we wouldn't have been able to come to that uh, understanding. Yeah. So it's very important to have a place, uh, a physical uh, environment that you can, you can, uh, you know, use, uh, you know, your ability, your, your scientific ability to be able to, you know, determine what it is that you're doing. And that's what we determined that it is uh, an art form. Our art form, jazz, is of the spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of my personal aphorisms is uh, the statement that there's no reverse bomb by the Meaning, once a horrific thing has happened, once a, a bomb has killed a population of people, there's no magic that we know of to bring people back to life. So, you know, it's an interesting thought. You know, what do we do with our lives? I mean, what's the point of life? I mean, to me, the best thing that we could do is get together and make music and art. That's, not, that's the, the greatest achievement, basically. Like, I wish there was some big explosion or something that could just shift us from here to there. But until then, we just, we sleep, we eat, and hopefully we can experience as much music and art in the meantime and have good conversations in the meantime. So, you know, to me, the creation of, of art is the highest pursuit. And it's the best thing that we can do with our lives as human beings. And, you know, if someone could convince me otherwise, then I'm all ears. But, <laughs> In the meantime, I'd rather listen to music. <laughs> so, you know, in that sense, I, I just think that, you, you know, there's the, the banker and the military person, and they have their pursuits and they have their values, and they see the world in a financial sense or in a military sense or whatever. But I see the world in an artistic sense, and I think that's better. I might not have the political power to just shove them out of the way or say, no, we're not going to have a war, we're going to make art. But I think that's right still, even if I don't have the political power to impose that. In thinking through that, so I want to phrase this question well, um, and, and through the antagonisms against what you perceive as a really existential, like, importance of an existential impulse. Um, what do you, ha like, what are the means through which you're able to counteract antagonism that you experience in the industry? Um, you know, for me, it's, you know, the construction of the creative situation, yeah. you know, which, you know, it, it could be in the recording studio, getting players together to, to document our talents and, and record the music well, and then it's in, like what we talked about, creating events um, where different musicians can interact with the audience, where hopefully there's, like I said, a community marketplace or an activist meeting, whether it's a fundraiser or an awareness raiser, yeah. but um, you know, I think there should be a lot more of that going on. I think there should be a direct link where we can get together in spaces consistently and address issues across the board. Like, I think we should be getting together ideally every day, 
But if we can't do every day, then it should be every week. And if we can't do every week, then we should do every month. And if we can't do every month, we should do every season. And for starters, at least a once a year annual concert where it's like we're going to get together, we're going to hear a lot of music, we're going to meet a lot of people, we're going to address certain issues, we're going to make people aware of different issues, we're going to give people an opportunity to donate, to support various issues, where we can feel empowered, where we can feel, rather than helpless, we can feel that we know we've done definite things. And I think a lot of us as activists are just, I think, um, people in general, the activists least of all, feel an embarrassment about not doing more about the world. I don't know, like activists I'm sure have experienced in one form or another where you say, maybe some, oh, I'm going to a rally, and someone say, oh, why would you waste your time doing that? Or they might have some feeling in opposition to you and you wouldn't understand why, because you're just saying, well, I'm not harming you in any way. And, what I'm standing up for is something decent and noble, but I think a lot of that comes from embarrassment because people feel like they should be doing more, but they don't know what to do. So I think we should create avenues where we can say, look, we did this much. I, don't, I only had $5 in my wallet, so I donated $1. You know, and, and I think that we can all, you know, there was a period in my life where I was prepared to get arrested. And in a lot of situations, was lucky not to. I'm not prepared to get arrested right now. And I hope other people are in my place who are prepared to get arrested in civil disobedience or whatever. So there's, you know, in different ways we're physically able or technically able, and we should create as many opportunities for us to chip in as possible. Yeah, I, I find all of this really interesting. It's um, in the last conversation we spoke about Sun Ra quite a bit. And we spoke about Sun Ra as a real galvanizing force in terms of engaging people politically. Mm -hmm. That um, it wasn't that people who were politically engaged were connected with Sun Ra, it's that people who maybe weren't politically engaged already became engaged because of him. And I'm curious about, yeah, these aesthetics and the aesthetic importance in getting people engaged in what you perceive as you know, a real existential um, kind of need to produce art, to engage with art, to produce well-being through art, to produce consciousness through art. What, are this, what can be gleaned from the aesthetics when we look back at this history, when we look at the law movement? Um, what is the historical legacy and how can we think through that in terms of our political imperatives today? Good question. Um, one of the things I want to say about Senra, though, is that um, he was on a mission to uh, to really shake up this planet, planet Earth. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he came here, he said, because Earthlings were slow and, uh, and uh, uh, a bit ignorant, and especially to spiritual things. And so one of the things that he um, devised, he uh, created this thing that he called the Space Core. Yeah. The Space Corps was a seemingly random set of notes um, that he would conduct. And it would be uh, the design, the, uh, the effect of the Space Corps was to shake people out of their complacency, to, uh, to shake people up, to get them to think. Uh, and um, and the, the sound, uh, you know, it, it's based on the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient reality, the fact that if you have people working together for any period of time, uh, you can actually get them to, uh, to think in a particular kind of way. Yes, yeah, spiritually, once again, it comes back to the nature of spirituality. Uh, and you can, uh, and, and with that sound, you can shake things up, yeah? And so he would do that. He would have us play a space card, and he, he would just say, space card. He would play it, and uh, and people were like, "What the? What was going on?" You know, <laughs> like that. You know, but it was uh, it was very effective. It was very effective. So, you know, the, the the fact is that you know you're able to do that with music. You are able to uh, to make you know serious changes, and and if that is your intent, and of course, intent is always the most important thing as far as an artist is concerned. What is it that you're trying to do? You know, he. Uh, I worked with Sun Ra spanned 22 years. I started working with him in 1975, and I didn't 
finished working with him until 1997. And I went from working with him to working at Sister's Place. So that's been, uh, you know, that's been my, uh, the arc of my life over the last, uh, what, 40 some odd years, I would guess. Yeah, like that. So I don't know whether I answered your question, but. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> I want to just throw in something quickly that just keeps occurring to me for some reason, which is sort of like what I would consider the fallacy of history in a way, because I look at certain names that, you know, get associated with, with the jazz idiom, for example, and then free jazz. And I could come up with a bunch of names of people I'm familiar with and then a bunch of people I should be more familiar with. But there are necessarily people who contributed to those movements who are, you know, outstanding musicians who just simply received no commercial recognition. They, they just didn't promote themselves. They were just great players. Like, for example, I think of my friend, one of my bass teachers, Orlando Marin Jr. He's the son of the Latin percussionist Orlando Marin Sr. Now, Orlando Marin Jr., he's not on the cover of Bass Player magazine or something. I don't know how much commercial exposure he's gotten in his career. He's been on tour and tour with the great Chico Freeman. I know he at least played one incredible bass solo on a Chico Freeman album. I don't know how many albums he's on. But, I mean, Orlando Marin Jr., for example, my, one of my teachers, I mean, he can just play rings around himself. He's Mr. Flamingo Bass. And he's not on the cover of Bass Player magazine. He just, if he posts something on the internet, it will be him with his, his kid in the playground. And it just doesn't occur to him to promote himself. So I'm just, I'm just giving a shout out basically to all the amazing musicians who are missing from history and her story, but really contributed a whole heck of a lot and were really amazing. Yeah. And, uh, Yeah, and what Jeremiah just said was perfect leading to what I was going to bring up again in reference to what uh, Professor Tate just said in reference to Lester Bowie's analogy that uh, he told his musicians. And uh, that's a very important component to look at uh, the generalization of people uh, playing creative music as uh, a vital form uh, are examples of what everybody on, on the panel was talking about in reference to uh, the actual efforts uh, in reference to disseminating the music, creating music on independent labels. One is Baraka's label, a mirror Baraka's label, Jihad. One is independent label coming out of Cleveland. And some that uh, Mr. Ahmed and uh, produced by drummer Steve Reed, who's probably a director. But, um, the fact that people of renegade nature are interested in organization as a way of putting out what they do and letting people hear what they do. When the people hear uh, what's happening, they feel the similarities that need to be inspired to do the same thing. And um, in reference to that, uh, Mr. Ackman, because I know that you were for Sunrise in reference to the East uh, in my conversations with Joe Ridley, for instance, that there was music happening there that you all uh, collectively engaging in even before your Sunrise experience. And um, do you feel that, you know, of course, talk about what was happening at that time at that location? And, um, the fact that it was kind of an outsider energy, if that's not a generalization. Yeah, well, I think I, think I did say that I, I played at the East uh, several times before I uh, worked there with Sunrise 1975 with, with uh, different groups. Um, it was um, a cultural center, and it was a, a place that um, it was very important to the community of Bedford Stuyvesant uh, during the time it was uh, one of the uh, places where we could hear uh, some of the great artists on the planet uh, uh, at a reasonable, uh, a reasonable price uh, in our community. And uh, because of the fact that uh, it was just us for us, you know, it, it, the music was different. The music was different. It, uh, you know, the, the problem that I would say uh, occurred, uh, for instance, with the, the loft movement, 
one of the one of the problems was that it was dislocated. The music was not necessarily in black communities. It was on the Low East Side, you know. Um, and so while the Low East Side is a melting pot, um, the particular African uh, spiritual vibration that one get from uh, being at the East or that one now gets from coming to Sister's Place, you would not get uh, uh, necessarily on the Lower East Side uh, because it was, you know, everybody was there, right? So the East was, uh, was one of the first places that said, no, this is, this is music for us, by us, and we need to have this space where we can uh, get our energy uh, revved up again so we can go out and fight this system uh, as it is, you know, because we know the system is antagonizing to us as a people. And so we need this oasis, we need this place where we can get our energy together. And they, they did that at the East, and, and we do that at Sister's Place, although we, uh, we open our doors to everybody at Sister's Place, so, like that. Yeah. And what, was that the same spirit of the creation of the Black, uh, Black Rock Coalition as well, because uh, I always enjoy hearing you discuss these things about what we're talking about now, generalizations uh, about black involvement in rock, and it, it shouldn't even be a question, especially the term rock comes from black music anyway. And, uh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, you know, I was thinking about Les Boy, AC, Marlon Song of Chicago, and you were talking about semantics, you know, uh, uh, around you know, what to call music. And of course, out of the Arkansas of Chicago came uh, their nomenclature, you know, which is like great black music, ancient to the future, but that idea certainly comes out of Sun Rock, you know what I mean, you just, you know, he's, he's, he's a person that really, instead of talking about the artistic legacy, he established that this was a continuum that, you know, uh, went, you know, in the typing of music, you know, he's, he's talking about Kush and Nubians of Plutonia, you know what I mean, and Atlantis, right. and, Egypt, and then you know he's also within yeah, yeah, within the context of a performance. You're also hearing uh, the music of his immediate kind of uh, um, you know musical idols like Fletcher Henderson, you know, who played and arranged for you know. When you went to see a summer rock performance, you got all of that. You got the space chord, and then you got the a oh man was James Jackson playing the you know the the. the Drum that was made out of a yeah. tree was struck by lightning, you know what I mean? So, but I mean, just, just, just that, um, but that connection of not just, you know, a, a historical uh, continuum of sound, but the fact that it's connected to these ideals like creating, king, you know, the creation and the existence of, you know, these great uh, uh, kingdoms in, in, uh, in Africa, you know what I mean? Black people being in control of their destiny in that way, in pre colonial. Period, um, and um, you know, establishing you know, the Sun Ra was a was a meticulous student of history. You know what I mean? So he, you know, before anybody else was thinking of this Pan Africanist, you know, uh, well, you know, people like the Boys and so forth. But um, but in terms of uh, in terms of the the, the the political culture, you know what I mean? Like Sun Ra is really the person who really established. You know, the precedent for what we call black arts movement, black studies, you know what I mean? That that um, that idea that you're not you're not gonna divide and conquer us the way um, and erase us the way um, you know the scholarship about Africa had, you know what I mean? Because he recognized that, you know, black folks were walking around deaf, dumb, and blind and uh, you know, their history before enslavement. You know what I mean? So Sunrise puts all of that into sound, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's not just he's titling tunes this, but he's also, you know, uh, resurrecting the spirit that created, you know, those, 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 uh, you know, those societies, those civilizations, you know what I mean? And, uh, and using his, the presentation and the articulation of, of the band to actually be an embodiment of that for folks, you know what I mean? And so it, it actually, you know, it's like you know from, you know, if you, if you read um, uh, about, you know, Sunrise history, like, yeah, he, you know, he used to get in debates with members of the Nation of Islam 
you know, in the 50s Chicago, you know, and had, you know, would be winning arguments, you know, kind of reshaping, you know, that, that ideology, you know, in terms of the way they thought about, um, you know, black antiquity and, you know, black futurism. You know what I mean? And uh, certainly he was a great influence on uh, Mary Baraka, who we collaborated with, you know, on, on like plays and musical events. And, you know, I mean, you know, when Baraka, um, you know, he was motivated to, to kind of rethink his course as an artist by not just somehow with, you know, Malcolm X and the death of Malcolm X led him to, to, uh, to you know, jump uptown and begin producing events with these musicians. That he, you know, he did that thing. He, when we talked about, you know, music, music was downtown. You know, he went uptown and started doing concerts with Archie Shepp and and Milford Graves and Sunrise Albert Island in the street, flatbed trucks. And so there was also, which was also countering this idea that like, oh, this music is too crazy and abstract. The black folks was like, yo, folks were out in the street <laughs> celebrating <laughs> that music. They felt it. You know what I mean? And, one of the things I've been, you know, I've been encouraged by is, um, um, you know, just hearing younger musicians now, you know, who are coming through, um, you know, there's jazz programs, but, you know, um, in their playing, like, they're embracing, you know, what, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the music they would, they would, they're not being taught in school, you know what I mean? You know, it's like, I don't know that there's a, Cecil Taylor course at you know at Berkeley or the or the new school, but I've heard younger musicians which are the, you know who um, who are finding in that aesthetic like, a music that's in alignment with their sense of resistance, their need to be in revolt against the status of, you know now more you know now more than ever you know what I mean. So you know again when you talk about artistic legacy, it's like embedded in those sounds you know what I mean already the, the spark in the ignition to free yourself, you know, free your mind, your ass will follow us, you know what I mean? But, um, um, you, know, and I, and I, you know, and I think, you know, I remember, you know, talking about artistic legacy, you know, it's like, um, you know, I remember years ago when, um, when uh, LL Cool J uh, came out with, you know, the radio, yeah. right, you know, and, um, you know, Vernon just said, yeah, he said, I just feel like a lot of the rage that was in, you know, because you're talking about mid 80s, you know, um, that was in that freedom yeah. move, music. He said, like, it's in hip hop now, like Sonic, you know, because I remember that that record was one of those records that just set people off, you know what I mean? Like, people, like, uh, you know, were taking sides, you know, around where it was, where, whether it was even, you know, it was even music, <coughs> music you know what I mean? Like, and, you know, I mean, you just generally, you know, I mean, again, like, the, the thing about this whole continuum of people who are considered, like, outcasts in the music is like, they they always you know eventually like their time comes like they you know they are always um, revived and, and resurrected and and, and um, uh, you know come to this place of respect in terms of the contribution you know to the music like you know once you've um, you know people have realized like this more conservative music like it it hits a wall you know what I mean there's just places it won't go you know what I mean like. You know, because I, you know, I, you know, I mean, you know, I go, I go to see, um, you know, women's orchestra, jazz, I think, and And for me, it's just always, you know, I just always come away feeling the same thing. Like, man, that's some of the best reading I've ever heard. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You know, but it's like when you have this whole, this whole other sense of history and vocabulary, you, you just know it's like, oh, they, they've already decided. Like, it's like it's just notes we are not going to play. Like they're just disrespectful, you know. It's like it's like a kind of respectability, uh, disrespectful politics brought to you know signing creation. You know what I mean? And so um, and everything that's on the other side of what they want to play is what was developed, you know, by the sun, you know, by the Sun Rock, Cecil Taylor, and Monet Coleman, and you know, Eiler, and you know, Bill Graves, and you know, just that whole continuum of musicians that um, you know they need to be in the. You know, it's like the it's like the tenets of the of the uh, the ACM need to be the tenets of most so-called jazz education program. You know, which is that you, like your first mandate. You know, if you want to be a part of this, is like you got to write your own music, you got to present your own concerts, and then you got to figure out a way to sustain like a solo concert. 
you know, even if your instrument is triangle, you got to figure out how to avant-garde that. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, that's a, that was like the mandate of, a, of the AECN, you know what I mean? And so, you know, because I, you know, I spent a lot of you know, time in universities, spent a lot of time with different students, you know, creative students in different departments. It's like, you know, one thing I, I, I see is that the difference between, you know, what <coughs> visual arts students are encouraged to do, which is like, you know, like, in, you know, just uh, try to exhaust your imagination while you're in that program is totally the opposite. You know, it's like, yeah, musicians supposed to play the most creative music on the planet are encouraged to be, um, you know, to take this approach. That's a classical conservatory approach. That's like, yeah. learn, read all these licks, yeah. play all these licks, you know what I mean? And, you know, you're not, there's no encouragement for people to be like, yeah, you know, try, try, to, t try to tap your inner sun rock. You know what I mean? Like, um, I remember I got, I got asked uh, to, you know, uh, come to a board meeting of uh, of uh, of uh, Calumets, and they wanted to really revive their music program because the students were coming in asking, you know, these questions. I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you know, well, what if I want to? I don't want to just, you know, spend my time here, like just becoming like a great French horn player. Like, what if I want to do multiple disciplinary things? And, Multi-genre thing. I said, y'all need a sunrise class. <laughs> you know, what I mean? like sunrise, like the way you want to revive this institutional pedagogy is like that's all sunrise. It's like you know, because sunrise whole thing was he wasn't even about freedom. He was about discipline, right? That was his whole thing, you know. But within that, and as, as I, you know, I to speak to was like, yeah, he would have cast at different levels, you know. But everybody had to had to deal with them seven-hour rehearsals, so. If you had no discipline, you would definitely get it. Uh, you know, you go to some rock jail, apparently. You know, the whole thing. But, but I'm just saying that you know, again, these people who are considered to be these renegade masters of randomness, they all had systems. You know what I mean? They had, they all had programs. They had ideology within the create, you know, the creation of of uh, their artistry. Right. And you know, what's unfortunately, what unfortunately happened in, in you know the conservatism of the corporatization of the music that occurred is that these ideas about you know using music as a platform for rebellion and resistance and and the creation of, of a self you know of, of, of like a, a, a functional you know a radical self you know kind of got thrown out the, the window too you know what I mean so uh, it's very encouraging to see you know, uh, situations like, um, um, you know, with, with Kamasi Washington and that whole crew of musicians he worked with, like, yeah, these are guys that, you know, they come and came up in a space and time where the impact of Horace Tapscott's Pan-African People's Orchestra, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, was felt and the elders, uh, was, you know, really, when we talk about the elders, it's like the parents of those musicians you know, we put them in situations where at 14, 15, you know, um, um, they're studying under, you know, master musicians teaching one of the, you know, the, the high schools, they're doing an after school program and then they come through that phase and then they out here and want to play their own music and, you know, they start finding space to kind of, you're talking about libraries and, you know, uh, supper clubs that have like the, you know, down, you know, kind of a downtown, down window, you know, on Sunday nights. And, and then when they decide to, to record, you know, I mean, I, you know, I, I love the story about how, like, yeah, they found a studio out by LAX, and then everybody paid for them to just all be in there recording out, out, out hours, you know, by one another for like three days in some sweaty, sweaty studio without air conditioning. You know what I mean? Like, that's the way, you know, you be about self determination. <laughs> be about like advancing um, you know your 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 out you know your, your position you know in the in the culture and the music you know um, um, through again collect, uh, collectivity cooperation collaboration these are things they learn Lamar Park you know what I mean um, you know in Watts you know in the way that they were you know they were brought up by the generation before them so that, you know it was a, they 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 become the content and aesthetically Again, talking about you know artistic legacies, like you know um, 
when I, you know, when I listen to Kamasi's music, you know, um, yeah, there's a lot of, lot of in influences and predecessors there, but, but sonically, melodically, spiritually, what they're trying to do, it takes me to um, Strata East label, you know, independent label established by Charles Tolliver and, and uh, Stanley Cow, you know, where musicians again created a recording situation uh, where they can advance this music of freedom, you know, this music of self determination, you know what I mean? So aesthetically, I hear that continuum between, you know, his music and theirs, you know, just the, the, the musical choices that are made, you know, and, um, and, uh, and then, you know, you hear, like, you know, his father too is when, you know, Ricky Washington, you know, um, plays, plays flute. And it's like, man, every time I hear his dad play, again, you hear all those notes that other people aren't playing. They come through that inspiration of these musicians who were, like, charged by the revolution. Like, they literally made musical choices that are so distinct and particular to that era. It's like, you're not going to hear anybody who doesn't have those feelings about about uh, community and social change, play those notes. You just don't, you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's just real, it's a language, it's a vocabulary. And I think at this point, like, there's more of a, there's an ear for it among people who are curious about the music, you know, and people, I think, younger musicians are hearing like, wow, you know, that's a whole other scale system. That's a whole other way of like putting, putting sound and vibration into the into the atmosphere. You know. mm -hmm. This brother advice every time he plays on, you know, he's playing all those notes that like, you know, these conservatives are trained troubles don't even know exist. You know what I mean? So yeah. Um, do you have another question? No, I think we could have a question. Oh yeah. Right. I'm just gonna see there you go to Okay. I wanted to just add, uh, my name is Lily Hidalgo and Mia, I guess why. Um, I want to add a few notes to the conversation. So with jazz, the music of the spirit, we had four women for Genesis, and I just feel like the voices of women uh, in this in this revolutionary music need to be emphasized oh, yeah. because there are yeah. silences within the silence. Um, so Nina Simone, yes. um, Betty Carter, yes. Aminata Maseka, as an infant, and Mary Lou Williams were the sure. four women who were added to the, the discussion of jazz and music of the spirit. Um, and to me, it's very important that when we talk about musicians and their intentions, musicians and their lives, that their whole lives and the, the, the collaboration between musicians and their partners, how that impacts what musicians are able to do. So yes. Studio Rib B, the B part <laughs> right. was B, right. you know right. what I'm saying? And, and we don't, we've had musicians. a whole, you know, like an hour and a half this conversation here without really touching upon that, these kinds of collaborations at all. And I think it's really kind of critical that we don't do that, that we try to make sure that when we're, we're excavating this history, that right. we're, also, we're also not contributing yeah. to you know, um, whatever it is you said about, about history. But there's a couple of other things. The music of the Spirit at Sisters Place for me over the last 20 years, I go in there completely exhausted. I come out rejuvenated. And that's the importance of those notes, mm -hmm. is that you, you gain revival, revival yes. and, and sustenance yeah. and your mind is open to possibilities by the tenor and the quality of the music that's played, right. which is not possible really, you know, you know, we, we can have a nice time mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. but that kind of rejuvenation is really, I don't think, possible outside of these kinds of spaces, which are yeah. grounded yeah. in African control. There's, this, there's a serious piece here that, that needs to happen. On bonds and, and us not being able to undo bonds, Billy Bang um, wrote um, a series of a, a whole series uh, around this time of Vietnam and the war, and he took that music back to Vietnam. Wow. It's the closest thing I know to undoing a bomb. I just wanted to, to, to say that um, to say that quickly. And um, last but not least, Sarah maintained a collective of musicians who lived together and worked together for maybe how many years? Like, 
some 40 years, and Marshall, and Marshall Adams, who is 95 now, is still leading the band. So in terms of institution building, which is what we need to do, right. Sunrise is also a, a, a master example of building an institution which has, to this day, longevity. Yeah. Wait, I mean, yeah, you, 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 you know, again, go to lessons, go to Sunrise, like, go to Laws, go to Sisters Place, like, you can't take real estate out of the self-determination <coughs> question. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, because I think, you know, anybody who goes to an artist-run space, you know what I mean? Like, you just feel the difference as soon as you come to do it. You really poets can say has that. You know what I mean? Like, you're just gonna have a different experience as a human being in those spaces because creative folks, you know, have have like kind of put their blood, sweat, and tears into like maintaining, um, sustaining, you know, those spaces and then keeping the door open for successive generations of artists. You know, and, um, yeah, and I mean, yeah, when you talk about, you know, I mean, just the, the you know, in the, again, in the pedagogy and the official histories, you know, of, of so-called jazz, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, like, there's just starting to be a conversation about, like, you know, what black female genius is, you know what I mean, and, the, the, you know, what that manifestation um, has been and the impact it's had on music. I mean, Mary Lou Williams. Sure. I mean, you know, you can literally hear somebody, like, who was cutting edge, in the 1930s, and then, and then she's doing a duet record with Cecil Taylor, you know, at the end of the seventies. The, the you know what I mean? Like, so you're talking about somebody who just never stopped developing their own ideas. I mean, you know, she did like uh, she did a record, uh, solo piano compositions about the Zodiac in the forties. You know what I mean? And like, you know, as as, as somebody that's that's. Uh, you know, in the black popular conversation about astrology, it's like, yeah, I listen to those things, I was like, oh yeah, she nailed Virgo right there. Nice, yeah. she got that dog in the Leave her there, she just got all our decisions, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So, you know, you're just talking about somebody who created like a, an independent creative life inside of um, the jazz business, you know, the bebop business is A.B. Spellman called, right? You know what I mean? You know, with, with all the ways in which it was detrimental. You know, to the development. Good. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, I just I was mentioning, you know, being Betty Carter. You know, a lot of this music, you know, Jim passing around about um, was um, was given this platform through um, you know independent labels, musician created labels like Betty Carter was one of the first people in the '60s to start her own label, you know, for production and distribution. You know, and then. Um, um, you know, with, I mean, with Adam Lincoln, I mean, again, you talk about again somebody singing the notes, you know, that other people don't even know exist. Like, I mean, you go back to to We Insist, and, you know, I mean, the screams and them, then just the way she's articulating, you know, uh, the names of, of of African cultures. You know what I mean? Again, these are like these are breakthrough sonic moments, sonic space increasing, you know, the the, the space in which we which we live. Alice Coulter, and never forget Butch, Butch Morris, you know, he pointed out to me, he said, yeah, he said, you know, this is somebody who was an innovator, he's like kind of that rarest of musicians who's an innovator on three instruments, you know, it's like harp, piano, organ, you know, then when you get, when you get to a vocal music, you know, she's added to that, and then you get to orchestral music, you know what I mean, just like, um, but, you know, it's, it's like we've just gotten to this point where the people who are, Writing about the music, like kind of some of the, you know, the dinosaurs, you know, had passed away, you know, and people with a more enlightened consciousness, you know, about the world, the world outside of so called jazz, you know what I mean, could begin to bring, bring you know, those perspectives. And then a lot of it too is just work that's being done by women scholars in support of, you know, Mary Lou Williams, Hazel Scott, uh, Alice Coltrane, you know what I mean. Um, so, you know, and that, I mean, and that's part of the, um, the way in which the change in consciousness that the music brought, you know, is, is created, it's created, it's, it's transformed, 
you know, uh, the thinking of people who are doing the scholarly work or the journalistic. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we're almost running up, absolutely, absolutely on that. And uh, for real, yeah, yeah, yeah. I asked some sisters to come, but they just they couldn't make it. <laughs> but that's for real. No, it's, and it's not. You find that in social texts about social movements. There's like the women's chapter, as if there's all this stuff happening, and they happen to do something. But you no, know, the narrative starts at the beginning through the whole thread of the, the story, oh, not man. just in the <coughs> chapter. Yeah, yeah. You know, know, and, um, American anarchy. Yeah, yeah we're going to move on to. Uh, to Q and A, to close, um, if you had some questions, uh, if anyone had wanted to ask, present. You, you, you talked a lot about the uh, importance of the physical creative space and the construction of that space, and uh, I'm familiar with the, uh, the theater community, the Lancaster theater community. 1970s when the, the space was open and now there's, there's just nothing. Um, and also the conscious destruction of that space by real estate in terms of how they brought in the artists to the industrial spaces to open them up. They used their sweat equity and then those same artists were priced out of those places that they had. Um, well, I mean, you know, the way, like, nothing's more religious or anarchic or avant-garde than capitalism. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it's fun. It's, it presents itself as kind of a smooth surface, but I mean, it's all about anarchy and destruction. You know? I, I was wondering about. Iran is that it was that, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I was wondering about virtual spaces that are now opening up internet and YouTube, et cetera, and how that affects the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, you know, it's interesting kind of looking at breakbeat culture. You know what I mean? You know, because I, because I feel like that's. Like, like the the most profound innovation of you know of of, of hip hop aesthetic is this whole notion of you know breakbeat turntables, just kind of isolated sounds. You know what I mean? Because that becomes the basis for you know you know the the the, the, the bedroom production. You know, um, um, uh, I want to call it call it movement, but just just. Um, um, kind of dy dynamic, you know, or dynamo now, where, you know, like, um, you got all this expensive, you know, you know, electronic equipment software, but it's really based on trying to recreate what, you know, Flash and Herc and, you know, Theodore, you know, did with their hands, you know what I mean? And so, you know, it's a way in which, um, um, when you talk about, you talk about destruction in space as well, you know, like all we know, you know, kind of as black folks is kind of this maroon migration, this nomadism, you know, this movement to like new ground. You know what I mean? Um, you know, it's like, oh, okay, well, the outskirts of the forest, I mean, we got to go to the swamps. You know what I mean? So, um, I think all these things are are connected, and I think that you know, there's this thing Ishmael Reed talks about in black culture called just group. You know what I mean? Where it's like every generation. Um, there's, there becomes like this viral incentive, you know, to kind of recreate, you know, kind of the face and the, the practices of, of blackness, you know, kind of white supremacist society. So the breakbeat is part of that, you know what I mean? And so when we talk about virtual spaces, it's like, yeah, I mean, people are kind of following that, that, uh, that intervention or that breakthrough, you know, into making, you know, uh, into the democratization of music that's occurred through, through software. You know what I mean, um, but again, you know, it, it has its, it's had, it has its limits again because we're talking about, you know, just the vibratory power of, of live sound, human interaction, you know, um, uh, and it's like, you know, on the one hand, um, you get, you know, through software, you get this encyclopedic palette of sounds, but there's still things, you know, there's still sounds that. I've heard this brother play, play, play with him. It's like you ain't you ain't get that to, to like you know uh, the process. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> like yeah, you know, to like some digital code, man. You know what I mean? It's still you know the, the DNA is you know still um, kind of operates at a higher you know just a, at, a, at a, just a more um, engaging you know humanistic 
you know, kind of, kind of frequency. But, uh, um, you know, so I mean, it's a tool, you know what I mean? Um, but I just feel like if, if we're talking about um, life interaction and interactivity, you know, between folks and stuff, yeah, you know, the, 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 the real estate, you know, the spatial um, uh, aspect of it, you know, still cannot be uh, asserted. You know, firm enough. You know, um, and you know, because the, the foundation of music is like you know, collective improvisation, right? You know, um, and um, there's just, and it's also about the real time aspect of, it, and the neighborhood, the environments it takes place in. You know, and then the way environments are just transformed, like you know, with Black Rock Coalition. You know, I mean. You know, like by the time we got off the ground, you know, I've been to CBGs many times before then. I mean, it's like a foundational place in terms of, you know, um, innovative, you know, rock aesthetic music. But I know that when Black Rock Coalition came in there, that was the first time, like, that club was totally filled front to back with black people. You know what I mean? And that was just a whole other kind of experience, you know what I mean? It wasn't just about what was on stage, but it was a way in which, you know, molecules got got supercharged. You know, by all these folks coming from Bronx, Brooklyn, you know, uptown, kind of for the first time into the space. You know, so. Next question. Can I ask that question? Yeah. And then, yeah. And then you. And then who else? I just want to say, for me, in terms of music production, I I love effects and modern production <laughs> techniques, and I think all of that is great, and I don't mind the uh, freedoms that we now have, the new powers that we have with computers and the ability to edit music. But to me, it should always sound like human beings made the music. You know, use the computer as a tool, but I'm not, personally, I'm not that interested in music. It sounds to me like it was made by a computer. So, I mean, the best experience for me in a recording studio, for example, is to take players who know an arrangement, know a composition, and actually capture a live take that doesn't require much editing. You know, that to me is the best feel when you can get all the live players to play all at once. And you know, if one person makes a mistake, theoretically you have to go and start from the beginning to try to get a good take of a song. And then as far as you know the internet itself and, and all that that represents in terms of distribution, communication, so on and so forth, it's kind of interesting because if you sign up, if you come out, like I came out with a new song, I don't want you guys to hear, but if you, if you sign up for an online distribution platform, um, like uh, TuneCore, for example, or DistroKid, and I don't know how many of them there are out there, you put one song in the, or you make an account, and now you are distributed to all these online distributors that I've never heard of. You have iTunes, Spotify, and then a bunch of other stuff that is appearing on different forms of technology or different networks or whatever, and people can maybe buy your song for a dollar or 99 cents at iTunes. But then you'll pay an additional $5 to be on YouTube so everyone can hear your music basically for free, negating, in, in effect, every other channel that you're being distributed through. So I just find that kind of an interesting representation of just the state that we're in that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's just kind of a deal that undermines itself. But then you say, okay, well, am I not going to pay the $5 a year or whatever it is to be on YouTube like everyone else? Because somehow, I don't know how it works, but if you type in, I bet some of these free jazz albums or what's called free jazz or some of this most creative music, it's on YouTube. You can go and probably listen to Art Ensemble of Chicago or whoever. You can definitely listen to Ornette Coleman or Sun Ra on YouTube, but are the estates getting that money? Is it going, you know, who, who's controlling that whole system, really? Is my thought about the internet. And I also want to just add quickly that I come from the school of thought in terms of my political orientation being a big, I guess, self-trained disciple of the situation that's international or France, that, you know, is that, you know, the anti-mediation belief. I believe the less mediation, the better. Meaning, I want to talk to you face to face. And if we can't talk face to face, I want to talk with you on the phone, at least. 
And if we can't talk on the phone, well, a handwritten letter is more personal <laughs> than email. And, and so on. And then, okay, if, we, if we're reduced to email and digital communications, then okay, you know, and that's okay, especially for sending quick messages. But I wish that we were openly not satisfied with that as what we call our communication. You know, I wish, our, I wish we all agreed that direct communication is the best. Yeah. Putting um, aside a real estate or and music, which is difficult to do in this context, uh, what, uh, what would you describe as the organizational and structural uh, successes of the, organist, uh, the collaborations of uh, either at Sister's Place or the Lofts or, um, or Sunrise? What, 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 what could you say were its, its, its successes? in terms of how they organize themselves? Well, I would think that the success would be uh, one in longevity. Um, the, the fact of being able to be in existence for 23 years at Sister's Place. Um, the success of, of Sun Ra, the yeah. same thing. Um, you know, he's had a band since the 1930s uh, of some uh, form, right? Uh, so I think that that and, 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 and therefore, having uh, the, the success comes to a philosophy, a guiding philosophy that, um, it, um, it, like in Sister's Place, we say culture is a weapon. It's a means of being able to uh, inspire and motivate our people. Yeah. Um, Sun Ra's uh, philosophy was uh, about um, uh, extra, extra uh, galactic things. Uh, you know, making sure that uh, we try to do things that were impossible. Yeah, uh, to uh, to do the unduplicable was what he uh, he instructed us when we were taking the solo. You don't want to play a solo that somebody else can actually play. You want to play something that nobody's ever heard before, <laughs> right? You know, so nobody can duplicate it because nobody ever heard it before. You know, like that. So these are the things I think that are guiding principles. Uh, you know, in, in those two organizations that I've been involved with. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that all those are, you know, just the creation of, a, of a sustainable entities is, is a part of it. And then there's, there's the aspect, again, of, uh, of uh, you know, some artistic legacy aspect where you actually create sounds, you know, or, or bodies of music that uh, got well documented, you know, because I think with some, I think there's about five, six documentaries you know what I mean? So when people want to know, like, you know, what it was, that sunrise, you know, well, I don't think I can find all 2,000 pieces of vinyl they produced, but, you know, the stories here, it's in a book, you know, um, by John Webb, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, it's like the, uh, the way in which these, you know, particularly with Sunrise, the way in which it operated, you know, the way in which the band operated, and still operates, you know. The fact you have somebody that is in their 90s and still wants to tour the world, you know, with this organization they've been in since they were, like, like in their 20s, you know, since 50, 55, at least, you know. I mean, it says something about just the validity and the power of the idea, you know what I mean? Like, you know, I mean, I think that's so much of it, you know, when you're operating, you know, with these relative senses of what power is, you know, uh, the fact that you're able to, to sustain something, you know, within this economy that is not about being mediated, you know, as Jeremiah said, for that length of time, you know, it's certainly a, a, it's certainly a structural, institutional success. And, and I want to add that I, I teach a course on Sunrise at the New School, and uh, I've been teaching <laughs> a course on Sunrise for 17 years, wow. you know, so after leaving the man, you know, it is, it is something about his music that is so, uh, you're so drawn to that you don't want to get, you, I enjoy teaching the, the, the course uh, every spring semester and, and, and turning uh, young people on to, you know, the, the idea that you can, you can do anything you want to with your life if you believe enough in the fact of what it is that you're doing. Yeah. Can I just, I want to make a comment about the, um, the internet question. 
I come from a place that you you literally have to drive two and a half hours to see any kind of live music, and even then, yeah. it you don't have a choice. You know, you know whatever, whatever band or, or musician is playing, that that's what you're seeing. You know, so the ideal is always live music at all times, but there's definitely so many groups of people who don't have that option. You know, so the internet is. It's it's definitely amazing to reach, you know, the people who are in you know different different areas. I mean, we're so lucky here in New York City. We can see any kind of band or anything at well, any I mean, time. Um, so, no, so, yeah. so yeah, I've traveled a lot. So I mean, I, you know, um, you know, and academically, so I got friends who are like, yeah, yeah, they're, <laughs> they're like it's it's them and maybe. One other conscious person, you know, yeah. in a five-state radius, yeah. you, know, you know. So uh, I mean, it's extremely. I mean, that as you know, that McLuhan has the aspect of it in terms of you know, really creating this global village that's you know, uh, democratically accessible. I mean, incredibly vital for now, you know, because it's America. You know, America is like a big desolate place when you get to, yeah, the, you get to the interior, man. You know. <laughs> Folks are looking for any kind of lifeline. Mm -hmm. you know, so I'm just saying totally to see. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about the year. Um, um, my question to you is I know you play the African Core, mm -hmm. and I know this recently there's been like this kind of like mashup of like the continent as a whole, that continent of Africa as a whole has been like kind of blown up. Like you talk about the internet is like mashed up, like, like you know. You know, Nigerian reggaeton and uh, Nigerian like you know hip hop and stuff like that. And I'm wondering like how you're seeing you're, you're playing interacting or you know, building a conversation between African Americans in Africa, for example. Um, and the, the second part is just a comment. I just I'm wondering also co comments last question. I usually don't want to say the comments question, uh, but like the, but like when she the sister said about driving fine music, like what role does the black church play in this? You know, saying it, it, it is it also a fight for the black church in a lot of ways, and with black church music and some of its conversations as well today. I'm just wondering if you've got thoughts about that. Black mosques or black Jewish spaces, I mean, that's something to what you would say. I don't know if that's what you The church is the funky R&B conservatory. <laughs> 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 you know, yeah. 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 So good. Yeah, you got the black church, especially in terms of women's roles, right? Mary Lou Williams and her um, extreme, um, you know, extremely admirable involvement with the church and bringing music there, and I think that being part of bringing black people, right? And um, her being overlooked, I think, in part for that reason. I think that's a huge part to do, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. Um, in terms of Cora and the, the facilitation of conversation between African and African American communities, that's um, a question that I, I don't, I, you know, it's like, that's like my, yeah, raison d'etre. That's like what I'm, you know, wanting to do, and I don't think I've necessarily completely figured out how to do. Um, I'm very much junior <laughs> in trying to answer these questions. I specialize in, uh, at the moment, in studying languages and their connections, uh, African languages and their connections with um, the construction of instruments, how instruments in the West African region specifically were used to convey messages and how we can understand language as um, a, a musical um, endeavor and vice versa. Um, and so messages and conversation and musical conversations with the black community are um, a huge part of my studies. I don't want to go on too long about that. <laughs> Um, because it, the, you know, I'm really just a moderator here, but, um, I do find myself deeply concerned with, um, the degree of richness, um, within that conversation and what the political, yeah, the, the political limitations that have been set up, um, in terms of hindering that, that conversation. When we talk about African studies, we think about African studies, you know, the kind of, uh, beginning point of that, you could say, was the early 20th century with uh, transnational conversation between Gardi, between Du Bois, between Amy um, Césaire and other um, African thinkers meeting um, and talking, and that was um, very much strategically curbed by uh, academic institutions. You know, when um, 
governments across, well, colonizing governments such as the UK, France, the United States, gave funding towards African studies, they strategically left out um, historically black colleges and universities, right? Um, so there's been a siloing of these conversations that is ge geographically oriented. Um, and I you know, think it's a huge problem. I, I do see music as the ultimate um, kind of vessel for facilitating further conversation between black communities. That happens just ever so naturally. Um, that you know, the music that we hear throughout West Africa is actually yeah, taken deeply um, cues from Caribbean music, from African American jazz, from lots of other things, and um, there's just this just incredibly rich world of exchange that you know hasn't been covered, hasn't been talked about, and that could be hugely enriching to Black communities at large. So that's a large, a big. These are questions that I have that um, certainly I try to do through my music. Um, but that I'm also studying um, formally, so I'd be happy to talk about that in another moment. And I think we're uh, down to literally the last two minutes. And I, I, to close, I think it would be good to close on what um, Ms. Monique just said in our field and um, as a musician and an artist, to close with what your opinion, um, to tie in with what she said, because that's a very important factor to my self-determination. That's not just a sideline, and uh, maybe we can close with whatever um, an exchange between you two in reference to uh, being at your position. Trying to make up for the women out here. Oh, yeah, y'all got some real yeah, well, that's what the sisters do it here. Yeah, y'all got some real We do, we do. No, seriously. No, that's for real. I mean, at the end of the day, the truth of the matter is for me is that the women are always there. Mary and Williams taught everybody. It doesn't matter whether we talk about her or not. Obviously, we should, but in the music, she's there, and that can't be taken away. Um, in you know the singing of you know even Mary and Anderson, right? I mean, is is there? Um, so. I think it is something that needs to continually be brought up, but it's also something that I think it needs to be said that's like, you know, women are still as present as ever. They've always been present. Um, and it's, you know, not up to a bunch of men to, to make it happen. You know, like, where we've been making it happen, we've been making it happen for men. Um, so, yeah, I, think, I do think that women are a huge part of this this conversation. I think that's the next, maybe the next panel should be focused on that. Yeah. Um, because I do think it is the determination of black women that we have so much to, to, to be thankful for in terms of thinking about music scape today and thinking about like, who are the most highly distributed women in the world right now in terms of music, black women, 100%. So um, I think that's a great, I just, I think it's wonderful that you brought up the four figures in particular that you brought up. Um, and. Uh, and yeah, hopefully next time. Mm -hmm. Right, you said right, you both said right. I mean, that's the truth. Yeah, and with that, I'd like to, uh, did you want to the same? You close that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank uh, our theater for being an integral part of these discussions and stuff, because I've been, uh, we also play music together, and I learned a lot from other music groups as an educator and everything else. I'm also grateful to everyone on this panel for being here because uh, I've been inspired by all of them in different ways and uh, I'm glad Jeremiah is here because we have so many similar trajectories going and uh, Professor Greg Tate and Mr. Ahmed Abdul.
videos of you so going to be up. Uh, yeah, on YouTube. <laughs> on YouTube. I know they go up on YouTube, do they, do they go up pretty quickly or does it take a while? No, okay. Not for me. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank, thank you. This is a great panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.